So I will read from the opening of the book a section called Letter to an Unborn Daughter. 28th of August. Now, as I write this, you know nothing about anything, about what awaits you, the kind of world you will be born into. And I know nothing about you. I have seen an ultrasound image and have laid my hand on the belly in which you are lying. That's all. Six months remain until you will be born, and anything at all can happen during that time. But I believe that life is strong and indomitable. I think you will be fine, and that you will be born sound and healthy and strong. See the light of day, the expression goes. It was night outside when your eldest sister, Vanya, was born. The darkness filled with swirling snow. Just before she came out, one of the midwives tugged at me. You catch, she said, and so I did. A tiny child slipped out into my hands, slippery as a seal. I was so happy I cried. When Heidi was born, one and a half years later, it was autumn and overcast, cold and damp as October can be. She came out during the morning. Labor was rapid. And when her head had emerged, but not yet the rest of her body, she made a little sound with her lips. It was such a joyous moment. John, as your big brother is called, came out in a cascade of water and blood. The room had no windows. It felt like we were inside a bunker. And when I went out afterwards to call his two grandparents, I was surprised to see the light outside and that life flowed on as if nothing in particular had happened. It was August the 15th, 2007. It may have been five or six o'clock in the afternoon in Malmö, where we had moved the previous summer. Later that evening, we drove to a patient hotel and the day after, I went to pick up your sisters, who amused themselves greatly by placing a green rubber lizard on top of John's head. They were three and a half and nearly two years old at the time. I took photos. One day I'll show them to you. That's how they saw the light of day. Now they are big. Now they are used to the world. And the strange thing is that they are so unlike. Each of them has a personality entirely their own, and they always did, right from the start. I assume that's how it will be with you too, that you already are the person you will become. Three siblings, a mother and a father, that's us. That's your family. I mention it first because that is what matters most, good or bad, warm or cold, strict or indulgent, doesn't matter. This is the most important thing. These are the relationships through which you will come to view your world and which will shape your understanding of almost everything, directly or indirectly, both in the form of resistance and of support. Just now, these past few days, we are fine. While the children were at school today, your mother and I went to Limhamn and at the cafe there, in the late summer heat. Today was absolutely marvelous. Sun, blue sky, with the faintest hint of autumn in the air, and every color seemed deep, but also bright. We discussed what we're going to call you. I had suggested Anne, if you turn out to be a girl. And now Linda said she really liked the name. There is something light and sunny about it. And that is a quality we want to be associated with you. They are asleep now, all four of them. I'm sitting in my study, which is actually a little house with two rooms and a loft, looking out across the lawn towards the house where they are lying. The dark window panes, which would be invisible if not for the street lamps across the road and the light they cast, which fills the kitchen with a faint ghostly glow. The house is really three cottages in a row, converted into one. Two of them are of red painted wood. One is of whitewashed brick and plaster. 
Once upon a time, families who worked on one of the big farms in the area lived here. Between these two houses, there was a guest house, which we call the summer house. Within the horseshoe shape the building form, there is the garden, which extends for maybe 30 meters to a white wall. There are two plum trees there, an old one, one of the bows of which has grown so long and so heavy that it has to be supported on two crutches, and a young one I planted last summer, now bearing fruit for the first time, and a pear tree too, also old, much taller than the houses, and three apple trees. One of the apple trees was in pretty bad shape. Many of the branches were dead. It seemed stiff and lifeless. But then I pruned it earlier this summer, which I've never done before. And I grew so eager, I kept cutting and cutting without stopping to look how it was turning out. Until finally, late in the evening, I climbed down and took a few steps back to look at it. Maimed was the word that came to mind. But the branches have grown back, densely covered with leaves, and the tree is loaded with apples. And that's the experience I've gained from working in the garden. There's no reason to be cautious or anxious about anything. Life is so robust. It seems to come cascading, blind and green. And at times it is frightening, because we too are alive. But we live in what amounts to a controlled environment, which makes us fear whatever is blind, wild, chaotic, stretching towards the sun but most often also beautiful, in a deeper way than the purely visual. For the soil smells of rot and darkness, teems with scuttling beetles and convulsing worms. The flower stalks are juicy, the petals brim with scent, and the air, cold and sharp, warm and humid, filled with sun rays or rain, lies against skin, accustomed to the indoors, like a soothing compress of hairness. Behind the main house lies the road, which ends some hundred meters further on, in a sort of abandoned little semi-industrial area. The buildings have corrugated tin roofs, and the windows are broken. Engines and axle shafts lie rustling outside, almost disappearing into the grass. On the other side, behind the house in which I am sitting, there is a large farm building made of red brick. It is beautiful to look at, towering up amid the green foliage. Red and green, they mean nothing to you. But to me, those two colors contain so much. Something within them exerts a powerful pull. And I think this is one of the reasons why I have become a writer, for I feel the pull so strongly. And I know that it's important, but I lack the words to express it. And therefore, I don't know what it is. I have tried, and I have capitulated. My capitulation is the books I have published. You can read them someday, and maybe you will understand what I mean. The blood flowing through the veins, the grass growing in the soil, the trees, oh, the trees swaying in the wind. These astounding things, which you will soon encounter and see for yourself, are so easy to lose sight of. And there are almost as many ways of doing that as there are people. That is why I'm writing this book for you. I want to show you the world as it is, all around us, all the time. Only by doing so will I myself be able to glimpse it. What makes life worth living? No child asks itself that question. To children, life is self-evident. Life goes without saying. Whether it is good or bad makes no difference. This is because children don't see the world, don't observe the world, don't contemplate the world, but are so deeply immersed in the world that they don't distinguish between it and their own selves. Not until that, that happens, until a distance appears between what they are and what the world is, does the question arise, what makes life worth living? Is it the feeling of pressing down the door handle and pushing the door open, feeling it swing inward or outward on its hings, always easily and willingly, and entering a new room? 
Yes, the door opens like a wing, and that alone makes life worth living. To someone who has lived for many years, the door is obvious, the house is obvious, the garden is obvious, the sky and the sea are obvious, even the moon suspended in the night sky and shining brightly above the rooftops is obvious. The world expresses its being, but we are not listening. And since we are no longer immersed in it, experiencing it is a part of ourselves. It is as if it escapes us. We open the door, but it doesn't mean anything. It's nothing, just something we do to get from one room to another. I want to show you our world as it is now. The door, the floor the water tap and the sink, the garden chair close to the wall beneath the kitchen window, the sun, the water, the trees. You will come to see it in your own way. You will experience things for yourself and live a life of your own. So of course it is primarily for my own sake that I'm doing this. Showing you the world, little one, makes my life worth living. Thank you.